I've got a couple more of your Olympic finals, Matt. They, they get more, okay. and, yeah, more and more close. Um, but that um, the race in Sydney, I wasn't able to be in Australia, but I remember watching it on on TV back here. Um, and um, I guess you know, even talking through, listening to the commentators, it was such a special race. There you are, sat on the start. Yeah. Uh, that that last 60 seconds is always horrendous before you start um and it it just is that that crescendo of of pressure even though we drove really well in the heat we drove really well in the semi-final um and we, we we got through both those stages without going flat out which is always that's always a good feeling particularly in a semi-final where you cross the line first, which we did without having to put in a last sprint in the last 500. We basically did a sort of, you know, first 1250 maybe of our of our final speed and then just held race pace through to the finish line. Um, and that that gave us a lot of confidence. But you just don't know. You just don't know. Um, and And by this point, you know, Steve is in his late 30s. Uh, we had a little packet of sugar taped on the inside of the boat uh, in case he had a hypo attack because of his diabetes. Um, and, you know, there were, there were other there were other factors at play. Um, for James, uh, 2000, of course, was his first Olympic final. Yeah. Um, not so for Tim. Tim had won a bronze in uh in atlanta um but you know you you think right it's all building up to now the next six minutes is going to decide this um and that is a feeling that i definitely don't miss in life <laughs> so there you are at 500 meters it must have been a great start really to get half a length through the first marker so so I so I would always try and uh, as as stroke man think right I don't I don't need to know where we are in the first five hundred um, I don't I, I certainly don't want to look because really my job is getting us off the start you know not over revving you know not going off at fifty five or something nuts you know we're big guys we need to be high forties uh, and then we would as you lengthen out, we'd sort of, the rate would come down. So we'd probably get to a minute at maybe 40, 41, something like that. And then we'd always have a big call at a minute, which is right. Now we're going to go for, let's try and look for race pace. Uh, and that would, the, the, the rate could come fairly sharply, but smoothly down from whatever it would be, let's say 40 down to 38, 37 and a half. And all those transitions in that race worked really nicely and really smoothly. And particularly at a minute, what, what's important for me is, right, this is, this is my best uh, guess or my, this is my uh, impression of what we're going to be able to do the rest of the course at. And it's not going to be stodgy and slow and heavy. We're going to, you know, a nice mix of lots of power, but also lovely rhythm. We're going to have some nice flow. And, you know, at a minute 10, minute 15, if you're in, if it's feeling right, then, then you're like, okay, this is, this is good. And there was an energy to the hull at that point that I thought, okay, this is great. And then probably four or 500, that's the first time that I'm beginning to then sort of use my peripheral vision, I would hope, but, you know, have a look left and right um, at what's going on. So second second quarter, looking comfortable? Yeah. We, so we got to, uh, again, we'd, we'd extended slightly. That first uh, picture, we're probably a bit more than a canvas. Um, yeah okay yeah maybe more like half a length but 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 the the margin at a thousand was one and a half seconds um and oh is that a thousand well done yeah 
Yeah. So that so so actually, what distance we took at uh, in that first five hundred meters or four hundred meters, we didn't expand at all by a thousand, um, which I didn't worry about at the time. But then I think we had a sort of fairly sustained effort from a thousand to twelve fifty or something like that, um, and it didn't work. We didn't move on people, and that was hang on, hello, oh. this is going away. Um, and that was the first Olympic final, certainly I'd been in, that we tried something and it hadn't worked, and then, but it wasn't sort of panic stations at that point because the uh, I think it's the Italians closest to the camera and then the the Aussies have got the green ends to their boat they weren't necessarily at that stage coming back at us very quickly and then probably wrongly incorrectly I got into a thing of thinking right we're half a length up uh, every 10 12 13 strokes is 100, 110, 120 meters. So if I package them up and do 12 lovely strokes, then we're closer to the finish. Now do another 12. Now do another 12. They're not coming past us. They're not coming past us. They're not coming past us. Um, and yeah, but 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 it's funny how I think the Italians at one point were racing the Aussies for second. And unlike other races, certainly that Barcelona race that we talked about, then suddenly they put themselves in in a position to win the gold medal. Yeah, and 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 that wasn't definitely not part of our plan. Ideally, we'd have we'd have been further ahead and and clear. But you know the lead now is coming down significantly. So whatever we did through a thousand to fifteen hundred, it hadn't worked. And then it was a right, okay, it's going to be a close race. Uh, let's get everything into the water in a it wasn't panic stations but let's get this last sprint done and this crew probably as much as any other boat i can think of had a sprint speed i mean you, you remember jürgen and his percentages he loves his yeah. loves his data and we used to do little particularly on final training camps we used to do little short efforts of 500 or 250 um at flat out absolutely flat out and this crew had a turn of speed that i don't think many other boats in my career did and and part of my thinking at this stage was if we're going to rely on that we're going to win <laughs> because we can out anybody or at least that's what i thought uh and then it felt right charging towards the line but then i hope you've got a finish line photo coming up because actually the 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 margin narrowed again between 1500 and and the end um and it was funny because i mean weeks later we were all we all rode for leander and we had a uh leander dinner uh this was september so we had a must have had a leander dinner end of november or mid-november or something like that and at about two in the morning in the leander bar <laughs> jürgen came over to me and sort of put his arm we were both really drunk and just having a great time but he put his hand round behind my neck and sort of pulled me in really close uh and i could tell he was about to whisper something into my ear I could feel his chin against my cheek here and i thought oh yeah. this is gonna be really sweet he's gonna he's gonna uh sort of summon up everything about the way that this journey has come to an end and you know, it's it's meant the world to him, and you know, da 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 da. You know, this is, I really need to remember what he says now. And he said we should have won by more. <laughs> and, I was like, what? and he took a pen out of his pocket and turned a beer mat over on the bar, and he wrote out the ten races or something through the season that we'd done in two thousand. And and he, uh, he put he put the winning margin in seconds, accurate to the hundredth. Wow. And he put a big circle around the bottom, 0.38. And at two in the morning, we had a discussion about wow. look, how, how could we how could we uh you know do all this during the season? And Lucerne we lost, so he couldn't he couldn't use that as an example. 
But how could we be leading by a second and a half at halfway and win by 0.38? That was his big... Yeah, yeah, crit- yeah. And he said, what did we try that didn't work? What do you think? And so the way I rationalize it now is that there was someone in the organization at that point who was thinking, right, what learning can we take from that and what can yeah. we what can we move forward with? I want to talk to you a bit about Jürgen, but there are just a couple of very tender photographs of you at the finish. You know, you had yeah. no hesitation, really. In yeah, going- it was just because at that point there's no there's no high you know steve's definitely not he's stopping then there's no you know and so to be part of that story for him to get five um you know that was that was yeah it was a sort of sublime moment um and 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 and, and each of my olympic experiences you 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 cross the line there's a there's a sort of firework of everything screaming and shouting and you know hugging and then because of being rowing you, you paddle away down because the, they want you to warm down they you paddle away to 500 and you watch the next race come through and then you come in for your medal podium medal um ceremony and every time i would do that i'd we'd, we'd be then be sitting up at 500 at that point all the crews have said, well done, and, you know, thanks a lot, and three cheers or whatever. And you're slightly sitting in the middle of nowhere for five minutes. There's no crowd at that point. And every time I'd find myself looking at the bottom of the boat and just weeping. And and it just it just sort of suddenly all, you just cannot deal with it at all. You cannot uh, put it, all this build up, all this pressure, and then you row your hardest and you're absolutely exhausted and and then you're sort of you're supposed to be elated but you're just wiped out by it you're just bulldozed by it it's um it's weird um i'm i'm going to get you to talk around that sort of fantastic last race in in just a moment but you, you know just a couple of questions did you ever have like a training session that you hated a toughest training session that um it was one you'd rather um, circuit weights were always horrible um circuit weights and then towards the end we did we started doing half hour ergos very consistently weekly half hour ergo rate 20 um and that and that gets under your skin as well because that is that is just a sort of slow knife to the guts um power per stroke every week wednesday lunchtime that used to be what um, about that one you did at altitude is that still a gb squad record no i don't think so i think a number of people have been past that um it's, so that so the, the the benchmark for half an hour at 20 was 9k and there were probably four or five people who could get over 9k maybe more actually um four or five people who could get over 9k in half an hour rate 20 on a row machine at sea level and then if you go up to altitude you're obviously uh working with seven percent less oxygen um and I, I i think i was the first to do it because it was at san moritz and san moritz is slightly lower so yeah. the the oxygen stats were on my side um to do it in uh is it Switzerland, Sam Moritz? Yeah, um, in Switzerland. Whereas I don't think I ever did it in Austria, in Silvretta, which properly is uh, two thousand above sea level. But I think I think a number of people have been have been over that benchmark now. I think um, Andy Hodge uh, went past it. I think Pete Reed, I think, did it. I'm sure Mo is capable of it. Um, but all these things sort of, you know, what, what felt, you know, our, our goal time for our Sydney four, the, the, what we thought was as quick as we would ever go was something like 542 or 544 or something like that. And now that sort of target time is sort of in the final, but not winning a gold medal. You've got to be quicker than that now. Yeah. 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 So move on. Yeah. 
I, I haven't got a picture of it, but I remember that amazing race, that 2K Ergo race you did with James Cracknell at the National Exhibition Centre. In um... yeah. I don't know how I won that, frankly. I just I I was really surprised that I won that. I I paced that really badly, and I think James. I think it was the sort of um, it was absolutely a microcosm of what we do when we pace things wrong because James went off far too hard and then died at the end. And I went off far too slowly and then just had this massive charge at the end uh, and just managed to nip him at the end. And But I think you were commentating. I don't think the time, I'll be interested to go back to the record books. Yeah. I don't think the time was very good. I think it was in the 50s. It was 550 something, maybe low 50s. But, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, it was just a sort of, it was, it was amazing because it was two pairs partners going head to head on a rowing machine and we came first and second and the margin between us was absolutely tiny, but it wasn't very high quality rowing, even on a rowing machine. Yeah. Matt, I'd like you to talk through that amazing final in Athens. I've got some pictures um, um, the Olympics. I've got some pictures of you sat on the start. I, I know there's a story to it before you even get to the start. Um, yeah, so so the change of crew. So we had to change Alex Partridge out. Ed Code came in, and this was six weeks, eight weeks before the games. And this crew, we had. We hadn't won all season. Um, we got beaten by various people. And then uh, James and I had lost in the World Championships the year before, in 2003, in the pair. Um, Ed had a whole story of his own, you know, getting to the pairs final in Sydney and coming fourth. Um, and so, you know, we had three races together as a combination the heat, the semi-final and the final of the Olympics. And so we are on such a steep learning curve that we had to really squeeze every bit of experience and learning that we could out of every session, every stroke. And we would set ourselves really high um, standards for what we were doing. And then when we get to the final, uh, we've got this plan, which is the quickest way to lose this race is is allow the Canadians to dominate because that's the way they like to race and win. They like to go out hard. They like to get the lead. And a bit like our Sydney crew, yeah. they would go out strong. And they, they, in some ways, they'd let people come at them in the last bit. They had less of a sprint than it might might normally expect. But by then, they'd develop the lead and they'd, they, they, they could win like that. And we said our first priority is to start with or ahead of them um and just and just get in the mix with them and that was different for uh, you, wasn't it? well it was different it was completely different because we were the underdogs we had no right to consider ourselves gold medal favorites absolutely no way um but we had this plan and and the the the, the other uh sort of card that we had which james um uh sort of interacted was we're going to do our final effort of 30 strokes and whenever steve williams who's the bowman says last 30 you sprint 30 strokes as if it's the last 30 of the race and whether the finish line comes on stroke zero or stroke 10 or stroke plus 10 you know stroke 40 makes no difference we are going to do that 30 and after that if you want to stop then that's fine um and so yeah we we that's 500 and we're in the we're in the lead uh, and so the first feeling is right great this has gone well uh we've we're, we're mixing it with the canadians they're not we're putting them under pressure we're starting to ask them questions very early on and um the longer the race went on with us jousting backwards and forwards with them the better it was for us um, so you've got half a second lead at a thousand. What's going yeah. through? Yeah, I'm thinking this is fine, but it's not enough. Um, and then, similar to Sydney, we tried a couple of things in the first third five, 
um, that again didn't really work because by the time we get to they're they're overtaking us there at drawing level, and then with five you've got a, a picture of five hundred to go they're ahead. Yeah, so they're they're a canvas ahead. What's going through and your I'm, head? Because you've, you've never been led in an Olympic final up until this point. Good start. Yeah, that's true. Of course, that's true. That that didn't occur to me at that point. That did not <laughs> that did not uh, pop into my mind. Um, but I thought, I, I, well, I knew what was coming, which was Steve Williams is going to say last thirty strokes in a minute, or not even in a minute, in in a few seconds, and we are going to absolutely nail it. And he, yeah, eighteen hundred. So he called last thirty with I reckon about 410, 420 to go because he didn't want that canvas lead to stretch anywhere. And so with 420 to go, he said last 30 and we started counting down in our head, 29, 28, 27, 26. And so in a four from 420 down to what is this 200 to go, we probably down, we're counting now down our last 10. And, you know, we've got a problem coming because you can't carry 200 metres in 10 strokes. And so we get down to, well done. You, it's almost as if you picked this. <laughs> we get down to, we get down to uh, uh, 10 strokes to go. Uh, or rather, we get down to our stroke zero and we've still got 80 metres, 90 metres left of the course. And at that point, we had said all bets are off. Um, and so with a hundred to go, yeah. So, so this, so we've, we've now finished our last 30, there's a hundred meters left of the race and we're a man down because I'm level. If that's taken across the course, I'm level with their three man, perhaps a little bit behind. So we probably got a third of a length there and a hundred meters left to defend it and no, no tactics. There's no call coming. There's nothing left to say. <laughs> Steve's not going to say, oh, and 10 more, please. So did you close your eyes? Did you keep them open? What did you do? No, I thought, I think I might have looked there. I thought, if I look again, there's no point. It's not going to make any difference whether I look now or not. And then I thought, I've really got to, whatever energy I've got left, which didn't feel like a lot, I thought, I don't want to... Um, upset the boat i don't want to catch a crab or hit the water on the way forward or and i was trying to row as long as i could which was never a particular facet of my uh, rowing stroke that was uh, lauded by the technical manuals um i thought i'd just row as long as i could and as hard as i could and as high rating as i could and do 10 more and then this is all over and then you'll know then you'll know yeah yeah um there, there, of a second. there was a big long wait for that. Did you, what were your thoughts as you were waiting for that result? So I remember I sort of collapsed over, over my oar handle, first of all, to breathe. And then, uh, then the next thing I did is I looked over to see where the Canadians were and they had drifted a lot further than us. Ah. And I thought, oh no, that's not a good sign. That's not good. They must have had a bit of momentum there. And then uh, Barney Williams, their stroke man, was shouting across, did you guys win that or did we? And I was like, okay, well, that's good news because he doesn't know either. And then, and then I started looking at the grandstands, trying to work out who was going to tell us. The umpire, I don't think, was anywhere nearby. Um, and, then, and then it just went on and on and on. And then the next thing I knew is there's a big grandstand on the left side, which is in the back of all those TV shots. And loads of people were jumping and waving Union Jacks. And then I remember Ed and James screaming and shouting behind me. And I thought, oh, I'm not going to celebrate until someone tells me officially. Otherwise, that's going to look really yeah. stupid. Um, and then I looked over on the other side and there was a, a big screen, not pointing at us. It was pointing across the course. So I was trying to read it from the side and, and that, that sort of data sheet comes out where you've got all the crews and the times. Yeah. Uh, and all I could tell was that the top crew, number one, had two words and the second was one, which must have been Great Britain 
and second was Canada. Uh, and at that point, yeah. And then it was only four or five minutes later that someone came over and said it was eight one hundredths of a second. Was that your hardest ever race? Got to be close. I think the hardest ones were that, certainly. I'd also put, we had a couple of races uh, in the mid-90s against the Germans in the pair. Uh, Lucerne, I think that was 94. Lucerne, 94. Steve and I had to row, row through Holzenbein and Strepelhof, and then we raced them again in Indianapolis, and both of those were absolutely brutal. Mm. Um but yeah, those are probably the top three. Daniel yeah. Springs, come on. He said your winning time at the Ergo Championships was 547.5. Okay. So not in the 50s, but still, for people who were capable of going sub, you know, I would I would have been happy with 43, 44. I mean, my PB was 42. You know, it's sort of... It, yeah. five seconds adrift of that isn't great rowing um uh, and and where where there's no <laughs> you can't blame the, the 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 water and the wind on a rowing machine it's just you and the, your only job is pacing it and you've got something that's telling you every stroke what your split should be it's it wasn't i, I just remember walking away and jürgen wasn't very i mean you know everybody loved the race and everybody loved the drama but it wasn't a great um sort of exposition um how soon did you know you were going to retire i mean you know before that race did you know that was your last race i was pretty sure it was but but one of the things again talking about learning from steve one of the things i learned from him is don't say anything publicly because you just you just create a millstone that then follows you around um and I and I I wanted to be sure, and I didn't want to. I didn't want to make a call before the games and then regret it. Mm. I certainly didn't want it to be driven by the result. Um, and then I came home uh, and spent some time with D. We probably had a couple of months traveling and just well, I say traveling. We probably had a month at home where it was just. You know tv and and uh appearances and speeches and it was that was lovely a open top uh, sort of bus parade in london and another reception in henley and just that sort of lovely celebratory month or something then we had a holiday and then i was i was just talking it through with her just saying i just i don't i don't know if it's within me i don't i don't know if i want to do it and it was sort of okay well you know don't rush and don't you know let's just think about it some more and uh and then i was then i was sure and then i went to see jürgen and i said i'm yeah i'm totally totally at peace with the decision to stop um so how, i wasn't 100 percent sure before athens but pretty close how was how was the transition from life after sport for you because i know a few athletes have had problems with that i i know you've got you know pretty good life now family life with kids i mean you know yeah. what, what sort of issues did you have I would never I would never go so far as to say I've had issues because um, because I called the end of my career at my timing, at my choice, um, from the middle of the podium. Uh, I wasn't injured, I wasn't ill, I wasn't dropped. Um, I wasn't sort of gradually dropping down the ranking of boats towards the end of my career um and i just thought no that's totally totally on my terms and and i was able quite early on i was able to sort of compartmentalize it and say look i've got to get used to the the idea that nothing else in life is going to make me feel like rowing and particularly winning at an olympics it is just completely different to anything else and um and then the other thing that i was fairly keen to do is you know find other things in life to enjoy and then suddenly without training you suddenly realize what all the fuss is about about weekends <laughs> you're like god these are great aren't they 
I mean, weekends are fantastic. You just don't don't really. You can make your own plans for the whole of Saturday and the whole of Sunday. It's great. And everyone was like, "Yeah, how long?" You know. And we just we just hadn't had weekends for I don't know twenty years. I mean, more since I left school. It was just like sort of absolute gobsmack. And then D and I had um, what are we talking? Eighteen months between between rowing uh no 18 months of no rowing no kids we look back on that fondly now um and that was that was great um just you know sort of being being around for her and with her in a way that rowing just didn't didn't allow it's um it's sort of a very it is a sort of selfish pursuit i mean i hesitate to use that word but i I think it's accurate because you've got to be so much in your head and so, so on it and having all sorts of searching conversations. Whereas um, sort of life afterwards, uh, I had the flexibility to, to pick my way through, which, which I've always, I've, I've really cherished since. Suddenly I'm doing, you know, I, I, was, I was slightly stressed early on certainly in the first four years, about right, well, what, what is the thing you're going to do? You know, the sort of classic question, oh, what, are you, what are you doing now? Yeah. And my answer is, well, I'm not doing one thing now. I'm doing about eight or ten. Um, but none of, them are, none of them are in the same spotlight than an Olympic final is, and that's a, that's a release. Was there any, someone, Phil Lubacic has asked, if there's anyone that you, you know, would have liked to have rowed with that you, you never got the chance to row with, you know, maybe from another country or from GB? Um, who would I have liked to have rowed with? Well, do you know, it, it would have been, I think, what we did really well um, uh, for a number of years is sort of hand the torch from one Olympic team to the next to the next. Yeah. Um and and I I sort of regret not I mean yeah I do regret it would have been nice to have rode with Hodgy and Pete Reed or Alex Gregory I mean he's a lot younger than me I suppose but um, you know that sort of generation coming through behind it would have been it would have been nice to have done that um, yeah. but that's quite a small that's quite I mean you know we we trained in squads. Um, you know, I trained with a Canadian. Steve and I went to Canada at one point and trained with the, those guys running up to the 92 Olympics because Mike was out there. Um, we used to go to Australia and train with some of those guys um, in in the winter time. Um, so we did get the chance. We did get the, uh, the the opportunity to to mix, and that's that was great as well. Yeah, I'm going to draw things to a close. Surely it's been it's been a you know an absolutely fantastic um, sort of hour and hour and a bit to spend time with you, Matt. But uh, I'm just wondering, you know, what challenges lie ahead for you now? Yeah, that 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 is a good question. I think I I don't know. I think I think within the sport and without the sport, it's it's. Uh, I mean, I mean, I'm in a very lucky position that I can sort of pick my challenges my sport has given me so much um whether that's sort of employment during and since um you know i love going to the olympics i love being part of the media operation that goes with it i love the bbc roles that i have around rowing um, um but but do i really want an out and out challenge in the way that my old rowing brain would want one i that doesn't motivate me. I look at James, you know, trying to break the marathon record that he did yeah. the other day, you know, 40 to 49. And I'm like, I just can't imagine anything worse. I just don't want to do that. I just don't. I just don't. Um, and, and, and so, no, I, I, you know, of course, there are lots of lovely things that I'd like to try my hand at. But I don't. I don't want a challenge in the purest sense. I don't. I certainly don't want a competition. That that I don't miss. Yeah, Matt. It's been an amazing, you know, spending the time with you. Amazing experience. And I'm sure lots of people that watch live and lots of people that are going to watch this, you know, when it goes onto YouTube and so on, are going to enjoy listening to to you talking about an amazing career. You've given us so much pleasure. I'd just like to say thanks very much, Matt. It's been an. Oh, I've loved it. Matt. I've loved it. <laughs>